channels and uh, part two of this lecture will be on enzymes and we'll talk about those in a bit. Okay, biological macromolecules um, are all organic um, and they must contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in order to cons be considered organic. Uh, there are structure and naming conventions for most of the biological macromolecules, but not all. The single unit is called a monomer, and the multiple units is called polymers. There are four types of biological macromolecules we'll talk about, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. We'll talk about each one of those. But while you are listening to this lecture, make sure that you understand what the monomer unit is. It is often also used to name the macromolecule. You'll see that later. Make sure that you draw the structural diagram, either by pausing the lecture or by taking a look in your book and copying that into your notes so that you can recognize it. You need to practice with this material. The polymer units, um, you do need to know what those are. These are single units bonded together using a process called dehydration synthesis. And you need to also find out what examples there are of the polymer, polymers and where they're found, and also what are the uses that cells or microorganisms or macroorganisms use these macromolecules for. Dehydration synthesis forms a covalent bond by eliminating a water molecule out of the bond. And you can see that happening here between a glucose and a fructose, combining to make sucrose or table sugar. The opposite of dehydration synthesis is hydrolysis, because you're actually adding a water to break the bonds. Lysis means to break down, hydro means water. So you end up with unbonded monomer units once you've completed hydrolysis. The first of the four macromolecules we're going to take a look at are carbohydrates. And these are commonly called sugars, um, and they perform functions in energy and providing structure to different components of cells. Carbohydrates have the pref or suffix sac saccharide. Monosaccharides are the monomer units, and the two most common are glucose and fructose. I do expect you to know what the glucose uh, shape is, but I do not expect you to know fructose. A common disaccharide, which means two monomer units bonded together using dehydration synthesis, is sucrose or table sugar. And there are several polysaccharides, cellulose, chitin, starch, and glycogen. And cellulose is a structural component of plant cells. It helps to form the cell walls of plant cells. Chitin is very similar to that in that it forms the cell walls of fungi, but it also forms the exoskeleton of insects. Starch is a storage carbohydrate, and that is a storage carbohydrate for excess sugars in plants. And glycogen does the same thing in multicellular animals. Glycogen is storing excess carbohydrates out of the bloodstream in your liver. So the carbohydrate structure is the six carbon hexagonal unit called glucose. And you can see here that the basic structure is C6H12O6. That's its basic structural formula. And you'll need to be able to recognize this shape. So make sure that you've copied it down somehow, either by pausing this lecture or by copying it out of your textbook. The second type of um, organic macromolecule are the lipids. Lipids are commonly known as fats, and they help to function in structure, providing storage, and also supplying energy. The base unit is not a monolipid. It is essentially, the most common base unit is a triglyceride, which is a glycerol molecule plus three fatty acid chains. Monomers really don't exist for lipids, but you do need to know what a triglyceride is and you need to know what a phospholipid is. And phospholipids will become important when we talk about the cell membrane because they help to form specific functions of that cell membrane. Lipids also come in two basic flavors and they are saturated and unsaturated lipids. Saturated means that all the carbon bonds, carbon to carbon bonds, are single bonds and that all of the rest of the carbons are filled up with as many hydrogens as will fit. That's what saturated means. It's got as many hydrogens in there as it can. 
Saturated lipids tend to be liquid at room temperatures, so oils are commonly saturated lipids. Unsaturated lipids have one or more double bonds between carbons, and they also tend to be solids at room temperature. I do expect you to be able to recognize that this is a triglyceride. Um, I do recommend that you draw it just so you can get some practice with it. So make sure you pause the lecture. You probably don't have a good picture in your textbook, so I would use this one. But make sure you get a good picture uh, written down in your notes. Some of the polymers for lipids include waxes and sterols. Waxes are used as a protective coating over plants. They help to reduce water loss. Sterols, including cholesterol, um, help to function in liquidity of different structures. Cholesterol helps with the liquidity of different molecules in the cell membrane. Okay, the next and third of the micromolecules is the proteins. Proteins function in chemical reactions as enzymes. They help in cell movement and they also help to provide structure. The suffix for proteins is called a peptide because it's referring to the specific type of bond, which is a carbon to nitrogen bond called the peptide bond. And it is unique to the proteins. The monomer unit for proteins is an amino acid. So in this case, amino acid is not the naming component of the proteins, but the polymer is because they're called polypeptides. Again, it is just dehydration synthesis, but the dehydration synthesis results in that carbon to nitrogen peptide bond. Some of the polypeptides include tubulin, which you find in cells during cell division, prions, which are proteins that cause disease, and albumin, which is the protein in egg white. This is a generic structure for protein, and proteins all look exactly the, ch the same except for the side chain or a replacement group. It could be a, something as simple as a hydrogen, and it could be extremely complex. So I do expect you to know the three components of the protein structure, the amine group or amino group, the carboxyl group, and then the replacement group. If you'll take a notice that central carbon has an alpha, as a subscript on it, that just means that there could be multiple carbons. Proteins get more complex the more you add to them. So a simple polypeptide chain is called a primary structure. There can be some cross-linking, which you see here with this disulfide bridge, um, but generally they're just a chain of amino acids, and that's called a primary structure but proteins can also make much more complex structures. The secondary structures um, come in two varieties. One is called the alpha helix, which you see on the left-hand side, and that just looks like an old-style phone cord where it's a spiral. Another type of secondary structure for proteins is called the beta-pleated sheet. And you have made a beta-pleated sheet at some point in your life. If you ever fan-folded a piece of paper to make a little paper fan, that's a beta pleated sheet, and so that's the other type of secondary structure on proteins. A tertiary structure is what I call the broken phone cord. So it takes a helix and then it jumbles it all together and you get this very complex structure. But that is not the most complex of them. The most complex is the quaternary structure. And a quaternary structure is defined as a tertiary structure plus something else. It can be an alpha helix, it can be a beta pleated sheet, it can be another tertiary structure, it can be uh, a simple chain, it can be any of those things or all of those things, but they become very complex very quickly. Hemoglobin is a good example of a quaternary structure. Hemoglobin can go wrong though. One amino acid substitution um, for a valine instead of, I think it's an isoleucine, can create a problem called sickle cell anemia that affects about 12% of African Americans and Asians in this country. Sickle cell anemia is just a simple gene mistake and it causes this amino acid replacement. And you end up, instead of a normal red blood cell, you end up with sickled red blood cells, which can end up closing up capillaries, blocking 
uh, blood flow to different organs and so on and eventually shortens your lifespan. Okay, on that happy, upbeat note, we're going to continue on with the nucleic acids and the enzymes on the next part. So I will see you then.